Eating the cats in Springfield. They're eating the dogs. They're eating the cats. They're eating the pets of the people that live there. They're eating the dogs. They're eating the cats. They're eating the pets of the people that live there. People of Springfield, please don't eat my cats. Why would you do that? Eat something else. People of Springfield, please don't eat my dog. Here's a catalog of other things to eat. They're eating the dogs. Whoa, 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 whoa. They're eating the cats. Meow, 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 meow. They're eating the pets of the people that live there. They're eating the dogs. Whoa, 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 whoa. They're eating the cats. Meow, 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 meow. They're eating the pets of the people that live there. They're eating the dogs. They're eating the cats. They're eating the dogs. Whoa, 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 whoa. They're eating the cats. Meow, 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 meow. They're eating the pets of the people that live there. In Springfield, they're eating the dogs, the people that came in. They're eating the cats. They're eating, they're eating the pets of the people that live there. And this is what's happening in our country. Okay. <laughs> Welcome to the Opperman Report. Boy, I screwed up there. I had the intro playing, and uh, but the we weren't live yet. I kind of screwed up the timing. It's a, it's a little tricky thing with the timing at the beginning. I got to edit some stuff but welcome to the opperman report i'm your host private investigator ed opperman you could find me at opperman investigations and digital forensic consulting if you email me at uh, opperman investigations at gmail.com now if you like our show be sure to check out our patreon opperman report patreon as a matter of fact if you go there i got all the p diddy stuff um i got the the indictments um and i got that jonathan odie video that's really good stuff, guys. You got to check that out. This guy, Jonathan Odie, in 2018, he went and shot up the Doral Golf Course, the Trump Doral Golf Course. And then he's in, he, he gets shot himself, okay? But he's like such a monster, this guy. He's, he, you know, he's ripped uh, physically, you know, and he's, he's wearing like a hospital gown. He's bullet holes in him, <laughs> okay? And he's sitting there being interviewed by the U.S. Secret Service, and he lays out 2018. He lays out everything that was in the Cassie lawsuit, and he lays out everything that was uh, uh, laid out in this indictment that just came out this week. Uh, so you got and a lot of other crazy stuff he's talking about. Too. I'm going to spend more time talking about that later, so, but that's in the Patreon right now for free. That's in the free section of Patreon. Forget that. Uh, plus, a lot of great content too on Patreon you can find there. Everything you can find Monday to Friday at AMFM Radio, you can find over there at Patreon, the Opperman Report Patreon. Now, the archives are free. You go to Spreaker.com. I do a live show every Friday night at 8 p.m. for now. Come January 1st, uh, they're going to discontinue this live uh, option. So I still don't know what I'm going to do. Maybe through Patreon. I don't know what I'm going to do. I have no idea what I'm going to do. If I'm even alive by then, who knows? Uh, but uh, for now... 8 p.m. Eastern Time, there's a live show every Friday night, solo show where I just talk, and then with two hours of brand new content every Friday night. Now, I know a lot of people have trouble figuring out which day of the week is Friday. So you, you have seven fingers or seven digits, right? You can count to five on one hand and two on the other hand, or you can take a, a sock off and use toes for the last two toes, or even five toes on one foot and two toes on the other foot. And that's how you know it's Friday night when the live content comes out and when... uh. What do you call it? The live content comes out. <laughs> and the brand new shows come out on Friday night. <sighs> Let's stop here. Before I get started, I want to give a little shout out, a birthday shout out to Eliana. Uh, Eliana Nicole Preston. Uh, she's 
big birthday coming up, four years old. When I saw a picture of this little girl, I figured she was five or six or seven or something like that because she's so big and beautiful and she's so smart. Uh, she loves Barbies and candy, going swimming, and she likes YouTube. And this is going to be on YouTube. She can watch it there. Like all my fans on YouTube. I got so many wonderful people that love me on YouTube. I got another one, Eliana Nicole Preston. And it's her birthday coming up. So happy birthday, Nicole. Uh, 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 Eliana Nicole. Uh, Ellie, they call her. So thank you so much. Happy birthday. And I got to tell you, her mom and her grandma, they're such nice people. They're the nicest people I've met since I moved to Florida. That's without a doubt. I can tell you that for a fact. Now, there's her birthday's coming up, and uh, her mom has uh, a lot of kids. <laughs> I and I wish I had that many kids, too. Man. Her mom has a lot of kids, though. And um, so they had a little GoFundMe that they put together to help a little girl celebrate at Disney World. Uh, so you go there to GoFundMe and check that out. I'll have the link on my Facebook and my Twitter, I promise you, in the Opperman Report Facebook and the Ed Opperman Facebook. And it's Help a Little Girl Celebrate at Disney World. And you'll, you'll see the name there, uh, Eliana Nicole Preston, uh, four years old. Happy birthday. A great mom there to, uh, and dad and family. They're a beautiful family, this uh, Eliana Nicole Preston. Happy birthday. Tonight coming up, uh, uh, we have two shows coming up tonight after the live segment. And Patrick Berge is back. Okay, Patrick Berge, who um, I love this guy, man. And we don't agree on a lot of politics and stuff like that, but we get along fine. This cool guy. He was with bikers for Trump, you know. He testified. He was part, you know, behind the scenes watching the coup attempt there, right? He spills a lot of stuff again. We get a lot of stuff out of this guy again. And uh, but one thing he he blew my mind, and I almost missed it because I've been really sick this week. Uh, there were two nights this week I didn't sleep all night long. I couldn't lie down and catch and breathe. I couldn't breathe if I lied down. I had to try to sleep sitting up in a chair. But I'm feeling a lot, lot better. But uh, the night before I did that interview was the night I've been up all night, and I had just taken an, a nap right before I did the interview. I woke up right before it, and so I was a little fuzzy. And he tells me this story about Taylor Swift. See, the thing with Patrick Berge is when he went and enlisted in the army at like 39 years old, some crazy thing like that, he went to work for this intelligence operation involving uh, social media manipulation and a computer program where they would um, data mine information about people and determine if they would be loyal employees for the U.S. government. And they're using this for all different kinds of things now. It's kind of like Cambridge Analytica, if you know what that is. And he just lays out. He goes, hey, you know, that, uh, you know Taylor Swift, <laughs> you know? He goes, hey, you know, Taylor Swift, you know, she had her start from Toby Keith. And Toby Keith, if you didn't know this, he just died recently. He was a real right-wing guy. And he was friends with General Flynn. As a matter of fact, he gave General Flynn in General Flynn's office, he had two of Toby Keith's guitars. That's how close they were. And Toby Keith got his start in country music by the guy that Patrick Berge worked for in that intelligence operation. Okay? Now, when Berge spills this to me, I, at first I, didn't, I, I, I totally missed the significance but then I, you know, I, I was like, oh, wait, 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 repeat that, Pat. Yeah. And I, it came out with that stuff. So that's a really good episode. Uh, then we have this episode with these two comedians uh, coming up. Uh, they had this incredible story. I was a guest on their show, and they were so kind to me. I said, you know what, man, we talked about this project they're working on here. Um, let me see. What, I think it's JT. There it is. JT Kelly and Sam Castillo. And it's called the Bad News Podcast. And they pretty much do the same stuff we do here. And they're stand up comedians, but they're not as funny as me. So I don't know. Look at, <laughs> you know that. And um, so the story about this FBI agent who's supposed to be in Austin on some kind of training mission and he walks into a nightclub and shoots himself. And there's no, people have tried to get the FOIA records on this and the police reports, and there's really no, it's a mystery of what's going on there like these mystery symptoms in Arizona. Uh, so that's coming up. That'll be in the second hour. The first hour would be Patrick Berge. Okay, and that's the brand new content for you this week. Okay. Um, let's see. Go back to the notes. Because I've got so many notes tonight. Uh, although I tell you, I, I regret not retiring last week <laughs> after they're eating the cats and they're eating the dogs. 
and they're eating the pets of the people that live there. How can you? <laughs> you know, when you got to do an hour of live radio every week, you know, plus the interviews, you know, and someone drops <laughs> something like that into your lap, you know? Oh, God, it's, it's once in a lifetime opportunity. I should have should have quit while I was ahead, but I'm back. I come back for more torture. So let's see. There's so much. Ten minutes in. Okay. Um, I breaking news: P. Diddy announces he's going to run for president in a bid to stay out of federal prison. I wonder where he got that idea from, right? <laughs> but anyway, we had this whole thing with the uh, Mr. Diddy. Diddy or didn't he? That's what I want to know. Diddy. I think he diddy. I think he did. <laughs> okay. You know, this guy goes back a long time. Remember that show when he had that show? Because, you know, I knew about Diddy. My first exposure to him. In fact, my first first exposure to him, I saw him at an airport with J-Lo. Okay. When I was back doing my stuff, flying back and forth to Arizona and back. And uh, he was wearing a kind of an ill-fitting suit that was a little uh, too big for him. And uh, J-Lo was a little chubby, I'll be honest with you, okay? And I, but I saw them, I, I, you know, they were standing right there. They didn't have a big security entourage around them or anything. So um, that was my first exposure to him. Then the second time uh, he came into my orbit was when I heard uh, that uh, when he shot that pregnant woman in the hand, because uh, my friend was the EMS driver in that uh, ambulance, Okay. Not the driver. He was one of the techs taking care of the injured woman who was screaming at the top of her lung. Puffy shot me in the head. <laughs> I'm pregnant. Puffy shot me in the head. Oh, Puffy shot me. And everyone and he, the guy told me that what they were doing was they put their fingers in their ears and they went, I can't hear you. I can't hear you because they and Puffy was sitting there on the curb with J-Lo and one of his drivers and bodyguards. And he was yelling out, I'll give you $50,000, i will give you $75,000, i will give you 100000 <laughs> to take the, the beef for him, you know. And the, the driver did ultimately take the, the rap for him of the possession of the gun. Otherwise, everything just miraculously just disappeared and went away. And Mr. Um, Diddy Love, Daddy Puffy, uh, went on his own merry way to do whatever he wants. It's my second exposure to him. My third personal exposure to Mr. Diddy was um, a friend of mine uh, was a cop in New York City and he had gotten a security cop off-duty job uh, through Keith Schiller who is Trump's head of security. Now back then at the time he may not have been involved directly with Trump. He, he the guy Keith Schiller used to work for uh, Fisher House the Fisher Foundation Fisher House. Fisher's this rich rich guy and uh, when he had this fetish of uh, uh, when his friends had a funeral, he would hire a thousand cops to show up in uniform and play the bagpipes and a parade of, you know, motorcycles, all kind of stuff, you know. And it was Keith Schiller who would broker those cops. And Schiller was so powerful with these cops that when me and my partner tried to start our little background employment uh, employment screening company in Colorado. <laughs> it wasn't even in New York. You know, we were starting this company. He was so jealous and so pissed off. He said, anybody who goes works for, for these two guys, you know, you're not going to work for me again. Like we were some kind of challenged him. Had nothing to do with what he's doing, okay? Then he hired me on another job and never paid me, okay? So that's where I left off with him. <laughs> okay. Wasn't a lot of money. And I didn't really chase him down, but you know. Anyway, um, my buddy was doing a security job, and it was a P. Diddy event. And the job went through Keith Schiller, Trump's head of security, who later on became Trump's uh, White House man. Now, you're not going to see that in the news anywhere, okay? You're not going to find that in the news anywhere. It may come out, ultimately. Like everything else I talk about, it comes out five, six years later. Everything else I tell you about, I'm always... I haven't been wrong once, man, I don't think. You know, fine, if, you have, if I have been, come back and correct me. So anyway, we what did we have this week? Uh, Mr. Diddy got no bail. He offered to put up $50 million and had a letter of intent to sell his plane. And the judge says, no way. And one of the reasons why no way is you're at risk to the public because you're threatening and you're intimidating witnesses. Okay? And there's even some kind of speculation right now about that Aliyah plane crash. Remember that? When the plane was overloaded and the plane crash? You know, easy to pull something like that off. Okay? Because there's a... This Odie guy, 
talks about how they were in private planes flying back and forth drugs. And the guy, he, but he doesn't name him, but the guy who got arrested, you know, with one of Diddy's staff, people got arrested for that, for delivering drugs back and forth in private planes for Diddy. But so he must have flipped on, on Diddy too. Odie's definitely flipped on Diddy. Odie's the guy at the Doral golf course that shot up the joint, shot a cop, I think, in there too. And the video is kind of funny, the surveillance video of him, because he's sliding around in this <laughs> slippery form that he puts up a big, uh, I think he put up either a Trump flag or an American flag. I got to watch that thing again, because I haven't watched it in a while, but it's up there on Patreon for free. You can find it there for free. Along with the song, We're Eating the Dogs, We're Eating the Cats. <laughs> I put that up there tonight too. Anyway, anyway. So Odie spills the beans and all this stuff then I, I looked into Odie it's very clear after he said in his divorce paperwork that he had no money right after the divorce he's running out and he's buying all these properties okay so he got a big settlement a big cash settlement I speculate that's from Diddy there's no disposition to his case he has an open case since 2018 where he's on video shooting cops I'll say that again in 2018, on video, he shoots a bunch of cops. He's on confession on video. And the case is open. Now, he pled not guilty. And there was, if you look up the case, there's a whole bunch of subpoenas out there for witnesses, like 100 people, which is very unusual, especially in a case like this where you're on video shooting a cop. What do you need 100 witnesses for that, boy? So, you know, he's using leverage of information that he has. He talks about some other stuff in there, too, about the Illuminati and all kind of stuff. That I think he gets from the Internet. But he was one of these sex workers that Diddy would hire to go in and have sex with these girls that were drugged. And then Diddy would watch and, and bop it a boop, you know, and do whatever he wants. Okay, so this is the thing, man. Okay, and he, by the way, he's saying this in 2018 before anybody was saying this. Before the Cassie lawsuit, before the indictment, before anything. Okay, so what do we have this week? Uh, Mr. Diddy, he hires this lawyer, Mark uh, Agnifilo. I don't know how to pronounce it because I've only seen it written down. Um, I've looked the man up. He's a very, very um, prestigious attorney. Uh, he hired. He worked on that Nexum thing for Keith Rainier. He worked with Harvey Weinstein and some other big uh, RICO-type cases. Only problem is he's lost a lot of those big cases. I think we're here got 120 years. And uh, Diddy here does not have a chance, okay? Even if he could give up the Pope. He could give up a video of the Pope screwing the highest of the Rebbe. <laughs> you know, Lubavitch Rebbe, okay? Both of them badoodling each other and still not get out of this because he's got those firearm charges. The face and the, the fully automatic firearms, man. There's a three, he has three fully automatic firearms that are unregistered. And he defaced the serial numbers off of them. That's a mandatory minimum of 27 years, okay? And I, I, I think they could give him 27 years for each one. He's got a good lawyer to negotiate that down, but okay, 27 years, okay? Okay? To start. The federal prison is not like the state prison, okay? Or the county, the federal court is not like the state court, okay? It's a whole big, it's a, 97% conviction rate, first of all. And then there's no good time. You know, you do like 80, 90% of your time, man. You know, there's no good time and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, you, you do, you, it's an uphill battle to, to beat the feds. All right. Now, so they deny his bail, saying, Mr. Diddy, we're denying your bail, even though you're offering us $50 million, because you're a risk to the public. You're a danger to the public. Because, you know, when we've got you here, there's allegations of you arsoning people's cars and stuff like that and um, pulling guns on people. You're, you're going to intimidate witnesses, you know. You? So they lose the hearing, the bail hearing. Mr. Agnafillo appeals that hearing the very next day. <laughs> so what happens? Live on TV... You see Diddy's son, who's got his own lawsuit for doing the exact same stuff, you know? 
which, which makes you think, you know, the father's a rapist. Now the son's a rapist too. You know, when does that start? You know, like uh, encourage your son to rape women, you know, or, or maybe there was some activity between them, you know, cause you hear all this stuff about Puffy being gay, Clive Lewis and Clive Davis and all this kind of, you hear these things, you know, all over the place. Uh, people are talking about that stuff for a long, long time. Other people, you know, other pop stars that are the names of are, you know, so distraught now they're they're not in the face of the public. Maybe they're cooperating. You ever think of that? Maybe that's where they're not on the public right now. Okay. So anyway, the bill is denied because he's a risk to the public. He's a danger to the witnesses. And what does his son do? He shows up to court with twelve goons, twelve huge bouncer type guys. Okay. I would call them thugs, but but the the thing is, thugs has become such a racist term. You know, if they were white guys, I'd call them thugs. If these were Italian guys, I'd say these are thugs. You know, that's what they are. But you know, every every black guy, they, unarmed black guy, you know, gets shot by the cops right away. The media, these people in the media start calling them thug. You know, that, that's a racist term now. It's become so. I'm not going to call these guys thugs, but they are goons, and they are bouncer types. They're they look like dangerous guys. You know, and they're not even dressed for court. One of these guys is wearing a football jersey. What the hell are you doing, man? When I would, okay, I had some, <laughs> everybody knows, okay, when I was, when I was around 25 years old, I had my first, first case. My first case was a class E felony uh, battery, okay, because I broke a guy's jaw. My, my girlfriend's ex-husband was being abusive to his own kids. He was being abusive to my girlfriend, and he was being rude to me, you know? And so I waited till one night, and I, we got him alone, and I broke his jaw, and I broke my hand on his jaw, <laughs> okay? Because I had already had a broken hand, but I didn't want to fight this guy anyway. And I broke my hand on his jaw. I had to go back to the hospital and had my hand reset. And then even, so I think I told the story, too, that while we were working on this case, I went down to the hospital and I pretended I was him, and I got copies of his x-rays. Because <laughs> back in those days, there was no HIPAA, no privacy act. You could pull off kind of stuff like that. I walk into my lawyer's office with the x-rays, and we're looking up at the light. What are, we, what are we looking at? We don't know. Okay. But when I would go to court, here I got, I got a battery case, right? And I'm Because, you know, it's a fight. So when I would go to court, I wouldn't bring 10 thugs with me. Wait, why don't I say thugs? I wouldn't bring 10 uh, my guys with me, you know? And I had guys. I had guys way bigger than his guys. When I went to court on my case, I had, I would comb my hair to the side, you know, and like slick down, you know, like a nerd, I had, you know, short haircut. And then I got glasses that were fake glasses, <laughs> you know, eyeglasses that I would wear. Okay. Cause I think I was wearing contacts. No, I probably didn't even, even need contacts, but I had fake eyeglasses, like uh, uh, Clark Kent. Like eyeglasses, I was tempted to put a little piece of tape <laughs> you know, around it, like to be a real nerd. So I had the hair, I had the glasses, and then I would wear a suit and tie. Of course, you know you do it in every court, every time on court appearance, except you know the next morning when you showed up with your rabbit. But uh, a suit and tie, and then I wore a trench coat over that, and I brought an umbrella with me. <laughs> Case I was like a, a, a British uh, gentleman in court, and even when my lawyer first saw me, he laughed when he saw me. You know, but that's that's what you do, man, in real life. But these guys are in such a bubble; they're they're so um in their own world where they're so used to bullying people around. They think it's going to work uh, on the federal court system to walk in there with twelve guys. You know, they're, they're a beef. Not going to happen, my friends. A big, 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 bad mistake. Now, there's another thing out there going on. Because, you know, I kind of tell you, man, there's so many experts out there. I love uh, turning on Twitter and, and reading the experts. Legendary experts. You know, people send me emails. And say, Ed, what about the legendary expert on the Epstein case? Well, why don't you have them on your show? Because they're full of shit. That's why. <laughs> okay. So uh, some of these legendary experts are pontificating. Yeah. Because um, Diddy's being held at MDC in Brooklyn, that it's the same jail where they held Jeffrey Epstein. So Diddy's going to be suicided, just like Jeffrey Epstein was suicided at the MDC. But the only problem with that is MDC is in Brooklyn. 
Epstein was held at the MCC in Manhattan. Now, these are both federal jails, uh, the pre, uh, pretrial detention centers. Okay. Uh, both of them. Okay. Um, now, both have the exact... I've been to both. Okay. I was not, not as a, an inmate. Not as a... I was there working as a private investigator. I'm on big organized crime cases, okay, that were held in federal jail before federal court. And the conditions at that time, back in like 1980 or 81, maybe, yeah, 1980, 81, the conditions back in those days were horrendous. They didn't even have air conditioning uh, in the housing where the inmates were, were housed. In the conference room where they would come meet with the attorneys and the investigators, we had air conditioning, you know, we could bring, we could sneak in food. As a matter of fact, um, we would, I'll be allowed to bring them clothes for court. Okay. And we would sneak in. <laughs> One of the things we would do is in the in the tie boxes, right? Like a two hundred dollar tie. And in the tie boxes, we would put salami in there so they could eat salami. <laughs> they try salami. All that got, by the way, all that got uh, messed up. We couldn't do it anymore because of John Gotti was bringing in turkey dinners. Man, you know this guy really ruined it for everybody. But back in those days, you could bring in contraband into the conference room, and nobody was really, everybody was winking, looking the other way. You can get away with it. But, oh, by the way, then they're walking into court. Their, t- their tie smells like salami. <laughs> this is what really goes on in real life with this kind of stuff. But anyway, so both of these jails are very, very corrupt. The conditions are horrible, but they're different jails in different boroughs. They're not the same jail. Okay, and uh, by the way, too, you know, I was uh, thinking about this because, uh, you know, Lev Parnas who's been on this show. As a matter of fact, tonight they're having a behind-the-scenes launch party because he's got a new show, I think on MSNBC, or it's a new podcast or something, but it's it's produced by Rachel Maddow. Now, Lev Parnas was uh, buddies with Rudy Giuliani, and he's the one who arranged a perfect phone call with Ukraine, with Zelensky and Trump, and he was involved in a lot of stuff because he was right drinking buddies there with uh, Giuliani. He was held... I believe at MC, uh, MCC in Manhattan. Uh, yes, it was, because it was the same one as Epstein. And he told me, see, because when I started interviewing Love, the stuff he was saying wasn't good for the Democrats and it wasn't good for the Republicans. Okay? He was, he was an outlier, like my show is. And I would say to him, Lev, you got nowhere to go. Come on my show. <laughs> Let you say whatever you want. He goes, yeah, you're right. Dude. So he would come on here, man. We got along great. Then the last time I was supposed to have him on, I was sick. I couldn't do it. You know, but he was nice about it. He says, oh, don't worry. I hope you feel better. And then I never rescheduled with him because I'm a little embarrassed. Plus, I wanted to buy his book first because he knows all about the Venezuelan coup, too. But he told me on my show, right, we got to make a clip of this and make a TikTok out of it. If there's anybody out there ambitious wants to help me out. About when they were holding him there in a, a disciplinary confinement, okay, or segregated custody. Segregated custody. It wasn't disciplinary custody. It was segregated custody. A lot of people call it the hold or solitary. They got different lingo for it in every state. And in New York, it's segregated custody. So you're in this cell by yourself. And one day, a note is slipped under his door. And who is it from? It's from Rudy Giuliani. It's Lev, don't worry. You got friends out there that are looking out for you and taking care of you. So, now that's a two-way street. That tells Lev, who's sitting there, and they're telling him, hey, Lev, hire uh, Bob Costello, who's Rudy's bag man. Lev, hire Bob Costello. He's going to take care of you. Don't worry. <laughs> you know, when you hire a lawyer for a guy, you say, hey, okay, you're going to represent him. Make sure he doesn't wrap me out. Okay, <laughs> yeah, That's how that works, okay, if you don't know how that works. I did that myself, and that's how I stayed out of trouble most of my life. But uh, but I won't last that. <laughs> okay, but anyway, but what do you call? It? But that's a double signal. That's telling Lev, hey Lev, I can break the rules at MCC, and I can get to you if I want to. This little note could easily be anthrax, or it could be fentanyl, or it could be rat poison, Mister Parnas. So keep that in mind. And very interesting that who died in that prison, in that jail, was Jeffrey Epstein. 
And who could get to people in that jail? Rudy Giuliani. And his crew of guys. And by the way, too, remember Stephen Hoffenberg? Stephen Hoffenberg, who was the president of Tower Financial, Jeffrey Epstein's partner, was on this show 15 times at least, okay, plus all the hours we talked off the air, an email back and forth. Sometimes I'd be annoyed with him. I'd, 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 give, I'd give a... To have him back now. God bless him. Rest in peace. But he came on his show and he told me about him when he was running Tower Financial, the Ponzi scheme with Jeffrey Epstein, that Rudy Giuliani was the corporate counsel for that company, paid $1 million a year. You're not going to find that in the news anywhere either. You're not going to find a link for that, guys. But you can listen to my show and hear it from the guy who signed the check. That's not good enough for you. Of course it's not. Oh, ho, 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 ho. Oh, you gotta, you gotta take it with a grain of salt, you know. Ha 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 ha. Yeah. By the way, too, another thing. So, anyways, that's a uh, MDC MC. <laughs> I see this stuff on Twitter. Jeffrey Epstein, uh, Diddy's in the same jail as Epstein. <laughs> yeah, like yeah. These people have no clue what they're talking about. By the way, Jennifer Lopez, Ben Affleck. Okay, one story out there, you know, in the because I'm I'm involved in the, the criminal defense world, I'm involved in the politics world, but I'm also involved in the entertainment world too, gossip and stuff. Okay, it's scandal. Okay, um, for people who don't know me, I was all involved with everybody with the Stormy Daniels deal and all that kind of stuff, Tiger Woods, all, all that stuff, man. Charlie Sheen, everything. In fact, uh, Ashton Kutcher, by the way, was buddies with um, P Diddy. And I did the cell phone forensics to catch Ashton Kutcher cheating against uh, Jen, uh, Demi Moore. And we have, I, I can show you the screenshot from the phone call from the girl, from, P, from uh, Ashton Kutcher to her phone. Okay. And uh, they said, oh, no, it never happened. <laughs> we got it right there. I got, I got a full report on her phone. The, the, the guys, you know, and he made her erase that call. We recovered the deleted text messages. The deleted uh, phone call message, the deleted uh, phone message, uh, phone lock, it was called. Okay. Now, uh, so the story is out there as far as, you know, those, my sources in that area is that Ben Affleck was shown a video of J-Lo at one of these P. Diddy parties. And that's what prompted him to file for divorce recently, because that came after the raid too, remember? Although it seems that they've been having trouble for a long time. Okay, packed show, huh? Eh? Was I kidding you when I told you I had a lot of info for you? Wasn't kidding you. Okay. That may be everything on Diddy. And I think he did it. (laughs) Okay, what do we want to hit next? Ooh. Okay. Okay, I'm going gonna, gonna to hit this one next. Mark Robinson running for governor in North Carolina. <laughs> you got to love this guy, right? So it comes out, CNN does an investigation into this guy, and it turns out he's, they uncover his activity on these dating sites. They're, they're called dating sites, but they're, they're really uh, extreme fetish perversion sites, Okay. Nude Africa, <laughs> you know what I mean? And he's on there talking about he likes golden showers, and then he's sleeping with his wife's sister and other women. And he's like a black Nazi, and his slavery was good. He, should, he would like to own some slaves. He's saying some really extreme stuff, um, really, really extreme stuff. Now, keep in mind, who's Ed Opperman? Ed Opperman invented the online infidelity investigation. Okay where I could trace an email back to online dating websites. Now, this Nude Africa site wasn't on my list of sites that I would check. And by the way, I've pretty much gotten away from all that. I don't do that stuff anymore for many, many reasons. Um, you know, now, uh, you know, I'm looking for lawsuits right now is what I want to do. Okay, if you've been uh, got a sexual battery case from a school or a church or a institution, a prison, or something like that. Those are the cases we want. (sighs) 
So Mark Robinson barely denies. He says, oh, this salacious stuff, and they were accusing me of, but you know. The stuff goes back to 2008, before he was ever dreamed of being in politics. Okay, so it's not like someone, you can't go back and dummy that up and fake that. Now, I checked right before, they now uh, this website is like shut down now. I checked it out, and if you go there and sign up, they send you a verification. They send you a verification notice back to your email, to, and you have to verify it. You have to click that thing. Now, back in 2008, I would say it was about 50-50, whether it was or not that, that they had that. Now, by the way, too, when I went into this show tonight, I was on the impression that he was also on Ashley Madison. Now, Ashley Madison, I could tell you for 100 percent fact. OK, I've been I me and Ashley Madison were at war. <laughs> OK, because they were trying to say that their site was 100 percent secure and no one could catch you on their site. But I could catch people on their site and I did it all the time. So what they started doing was they started hiring, hiring me under like fake accounts and fake names and stuff like that, fake credit cards, and ordering the service on me, and I'd go back, and then I would go in, I'd get in, and send them the results, okay? And they would take down the ad saying that they were 100% secure, <laughs> okay? Then they would go back and they would change some stuff. And then I, I would go in and i say, oh no, I can't get in anymore. Then it would change, and I would go back and get back, and they would put the ad back up. <laughs> and I would go back in and get back in the second way, and then they would go back and say, oh no, we're not, over, we're, we're not 100% secure there. So I was at war with them. So I, my understanding as of time of the airing of the show is that the Richard Robinson was also on Ashley Madison. And if he was, I could tell you at that time, they would definitely confirmed your email. Um, but now I'm, I'm not 100% sure that he was on that side. I only know about him being on these black African, uh, nude African websites, whatever they're called. Oh, my God. <sighs> Let's see. Okay, there's so much here. Oh, oh, I forgot about P. Diddy. There's one more thing about P. Diddy. Because remember back when he was on that TV show, Making the Band, right? <laughs> and I remember one of the guys, and I watched, I liked the shows. And he was on the show, Making the Band. And he had one house with all uh, male rappers and another house with all female rappers. And when there, there was an episode, like the first episode, when they're showing him the, the apartments where they're going to be staying, and he goes, no, nah, man, you got you to gotta trick these houses out, man, with flat screen TVs and give them all this stuff. And every, every rapper has flat screen TVs. Now, back then, they were five $6,000. Then it came out in the gossip columns back then that when the show ended, somebody on Diddy's crew went in there and stole all the TVs and the computer and the, the filming equipment. <laughs> Robbed the joints and burglarized the places, you know. And they were saying it had to be Diddy's guys. You know, you go back and look for that now. It's all gone. Okay. Now people are telling me, "Hey Ed, use the Internet Archive, use the Wayback Machine." That's not what I'm talking about. Um, I've been involved in high-profile uh, lawsuits and litigation negotiations, where on the day of negotiation, I'm not there. They don't let me sit there and negotiate with them when they're doing that. But I'm sitting home, furious, trying to, <laughs> feverishly trying to figure out you know, how much we're going to get today, okay? And you'll see during the negotiation, they're removing stuff because when, you, when, you when you send the intent to sue and you leak it to the gossip columns and it goes on the Wikipedia page, and then on the day of negotiation, you see it, the whole lawsuit just disappeared from Wikipedia. The lawsuit disappeared from Variety. <laughs> People like at Variety and, and Radar Online, they're in on these negotiations too. And they're removing this stuff at the request of the attorneys and the people involved that are negotiating this deal. That's how this stuff works. So Diddy had some kind of PR firm that was powerful enough to get all this stuff removed. Just like Ashton Kutcher had a PR firm powerful enough to get us to back off. And, and, and even though we had the evidence to say, oh, that nothing happened. Because when Ashton Kutcher, when he got caught with the next girl, then Demi Moore admitted, yeah, he's a cheater. Then suddenly everyone believes that one. Okay? Now, Kutcher, too, man, he's, he's, he, the guy's got a lot of stuff, man, a lot of shady stuff in his background. All this business about him developing the software to help traffic kids, that's a, that's a meme that is crap. This is a guy that was a business partner with a, 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 a restaurant group that was run by a guy that was involved with rape and sexual harassment, all kind of stuff. Okay, that's pretty much scrubbed too. All right, 
I tell you, I'm, I don't lose your temper. Yeah. Calm down. Hey. All right, real quick. Let's hit you with some bullet points. You may have seen some news about how they, in Arizona, they discovered 90,000 illegal aliens registered to vote. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, here's the real story about that. That's a clickbait. When you know what's really going on, you know, but, but, you know, and then you try to argue with people. Nobody really cares. Between 1994 and 2006, uh, the DMV in Arizona did not have the option. You you did not have to be a. Um, they didn't require proof that you were a, a, a resident, a citizen, in order to check off that box and reg- check off that box and register to vote. And between that time, there were 90,000 voter registrations. We have no idea how many of them were Ill- or any kind of immigrants or illegal aliens whatsoever. We have no idea how many of those 90,000 are citizens or how many are illegal aliens. But we do know statistically how many illegals there are compared to citizens in the state of Arizona. So we can use that formula. So right away, you know, we're t- you know there, there aren't fifty percent illegals, or forty percent illegals, or even twenty percent. Even in a state like Arizona, that's right by the border, maybe twenty five percent are illegal, or twenty percent are illegal. Okay, so out of that ninety thousand, right away, we're talking about only twenty percent of that. Now, out of them, how many of them bother to vote? <laughs> well, only forty fifty percent of people vote anyway. So it's even knocked that down another notch, right? Now, guess what? The Republicans are pushing us all over the place that there's 90,000 illegal aliens that are going to vote Democrat in Arizona. And we've got to stop them. But guess who doesn't want to stop them? The Arizona GOP. (laughs) Because they know most of those people are Republican. (laughs) Because they're mostly in Republican districts. So it's so crazy. It's so crazy what goes on in the the meme world and the Twitter world and the TikTok world and what really goes on in these offices, okay, of these political campaigns around the country. It's it's night and day. I got to say, there's something to Alex Jones. This thing came out. Uh, The people who attended the rally in Tucson right before the whole cat thing blew up. That 20 people that were on the stage with Trump got mysterious symptoms that caused some of them to go to the hospital. Okay. Now, I was sick this week. I know what my symptoms are. <laughs> I know what my symptoms are. How can a symptom be mysterious? They're talking about burning skin. Now they're talking about their eyes were burning. Alex Jones says it was infrared lasers, right? Uh, you know, all this kind of nonsense, right, that they're saying. Uh, but how could you not know what the symptoms are, right? So I think it's hysteria. But otherwise, that's not making a lot of traction either. But they're calling it the, the fourth assassination attempt against Mr. Trump. And speaking of assassination attempts, we didn't even get a chance to talk about that one. What's that guy's name? Roosh? Uh, Ruth? Where do I get that in my notes? Oh, yeah. Ruth. What the hell? <laughs> but guys, the most mysterious thing about this guy or the most interesting thing about him that's not being reported whatsoever is that he was involved in some kind of project. He was in Afghanistan and he was recruiting disillusioned fighters in Afghanistan to go to Ukraine and fight in Ukraine against Russia. How come that? How, why is that not the top story about this guy? Is anybody talking about that? It was all over his Twitter page. I saw it myself with my own eyes. So that seems to me to be the most suspicious thing about him. Okay. Uh, oh, 44 minutes. We're doing good on time. Okay. Uh, I should have got some melatonin or something like that to help me go to sleep tonight. I think I'm going to be a little wired tonight. Uh, another thing that happened in the past couple of weeks I haven't been able to address is Andrew Tate. Uh was raided like a second time and uh, 
they've got all kinds of crazy serious charges about him right now, including Ainley raping a 15-year-old. He started ra- raping this girl Ainley when she was 15 years old and another one who's 17 years old. And it's not just, you know, first of all, in the first set of cases, I think there's like 40 victims at this point. Yeah, 42 victims they got in Romania. Oh, and everyone's talking about this girl from the U.S. who flew over there and her boyfriend called and blah, 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 all that, that crazy story. They also have psychological reports of, of all the victims in that small case. Now, this time, they got wiretaps, okay, of him talking to his brother, telling his brother to impregnate these girls and get them pregnant. There's chats directly off their device. There's audio messages. There's witnesses. There's photographic evidence, closed-circuit TV, financial records. Tate's own video courses, which I've talked about before, where he taught uh, the exploitation. Um, there's reports of violence and photos of the violence, medical reports, threats of violence, blackmail, and endless examples of coercion and exploitation. The whole Andrew Tate thing is totally underreported. But I got to tell you something. And I, I, this was one of my questions for Berg. I didn't get a chance to ask him. Is because the whole Andrew Tate skyrocketing to fame and power on TikTok and Instagram and Reels and all that kind of stuff. It's that same kind of Cambridge Analytica uh, media manipulation. The same thing we saw with Johnny Depp. When Johnny Depp had his case and suddenly there were thousands of TikToks about Johnny Depp and strutting into court. You know, and oh, and look how stupid the other lawyer is, and look at how Johnny Depp's lawyer won again. Another stupid question. You know, look how look how we dressed it. Thousands of TikToks and reels. Uh, Johnny, how come they're not now? To, how come everybody's not obsessed with Johnny Depp now and what he's doing? Only during his trial. That was a PR campaign that that had access to this kind of data, man. You know, that's that's. And it seems like Taylor Swift too, I guess now. Right? You know, where, you know, how did she skyrocket to fame? What's her talent? <laughs> you know, I know people love right now, but I don't want to piss off the Swifties. That's the last thing I want to say. I, I love Taylor Swift. <laughs> I am the original Swiftie. I'm the biggest Swiftie in town. My daughter's a Swiftie. Oh, how about another thing here, too? What about these Israeli pagers going off? Now, you guys know I've had a lot of people on the show that are CIA and intelligence and State Department and, you know, and all that. Even some of them are obviously are, and they don't come out and say it. So I started nosing around about this thing. If you don't know what happened, because it's really not that publicized. You got to really be a news junkie to follow this stuff. Is that Israel somehow, Hamas and Hezbollah, Hezbollah it was, right? I think they were over in Syria. Hezbollah. Um, they started telling their their people in their organization stop using smartphones because the Israelis can track us with these smartphones. So can the Americans, which is true. Start using beepers and radios. Now somehow, the Mossad got into the supply chain of the manufacturer of these beepers and put explosives in them that they could trigger. You know, by sending a page to the, to the pages. So they had the numbers, right? And they were able to access these devices and then put them back into the supply chain and know who was using them. Because the first round of bombings, and by the way, they killed 40 people. They injured 3,000 people. Over in the Middle East right now, you're not allowed to bring a page or a radio onto a, 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 a plane and now these guys aren't even using laptops. It's got to be in the laptops too, right? Maybe there's one in my laptop right now. Maybe there's one in my phone right now. Maybe there's one in your phone right now. Now I talk to people I know, you know, in these circles, and I says that, well, I don't, we don't have that capability to do that in the United States. We don't have that capable to, to intercept the supply chain and get devices to specific people. We, we want, not that I know of, you know? So this is a whole new era of terror. State-sponsored terror by the state of Israel. And bad enough, there's genocide. Now they're targeting the innocent people. They just bombed the school the other day. Hey. Should have quit last week. Oh, one of my chat room people says she loves Taylor Swift too. I love Taylor Swift. <laughs> I love Taylor Swift. Actually, 
I don't know what she's doing. <laughs> I don't know anything about Taylor Swift. I know a couple of her songs. Never, never, never get back together. <clears throat> hey, okay. Andrew Tate. <clears throat> Here's another thing that make the news. <clears throat> came out that the Trump campaign was hacked and the hack appears to be from Iran and Iran has offered their hacked material to news outlets in the United States and no one's published it now friends of mine have said hey man give it to me and I'll publish it I just reached out to some people at what's that press TV that I know and I says hey can you get out can you get a hold of the stuff and send it he says oh we don't, we don't what are you talking about <laughs> I don't know anything about that Ed. okay so but now they're saying that uh, because they gave them the, because Iran tried to give the material over to the the Harris campaign, that it's the same thing as Russian interference. <clears throat> but the difference in this case <clears throat> is that we know that people like Roger Stone were running around trying to buy that Russian hack into uh, the DNC and Podesta's computer, right? We, we we've seen it. Even uh, Roger Stone did a whole thing with this dossier thing, you know, and, and, and tried to give his version of the story. And he made it look like an investigative dossier with all kind of graphics on it and stuff. Not a big top secret stamp on it, you know. So it's not the same thing because it's not like the, the, we find out the Harris campaign was reaching out to the, to the, to the, to the Iranians trying to get that information like Ed Hoffman just did. <laughs> Many of thousands of people. That's a different story. But until then, we don't know. <clears throat> Uh, sorry, I'm losing my voice. Um, good, we're doing good. Okay, now a couple of things here, man. Oh, Matt Gates, damn. New, I don't have the copies of the paperwork yet, man, and it's kind of pissing me off because there's guys I know who have it. Come on, guys, give me a call, please. Return my messages. I think I, I, uh, uh, what do you call that? Uh, um, uh, I'm not offended, kind of ostracize some people, you know. I run this Gates situation, maybe being a little too pushy about things. But there's guys out there who I know have this newly uh, newly filed Gates court docs where they describe the party where he was at with this 17-year-old. Now, I've heard about this story many, many times with this lobbyist. I don't have it written down in front of me. I really I dropped the ball on this one. I apologize. I didn't even know. I, this would have been one of my top things. I'll do it next week. Or maybe I'll do a show midweek about this whole Matt Gates thing. New paperwork came out. His buddy lobbyist got into a beef with his attorneys he didn't pay his attorney fees his litigation back and forth and they're describing this party with this 17 year old okay that for a fact we know that because joel greenberg says hey man gates hired me to pick up this 17 year old who was a high school junior by the way not even a senior in high school you know a high school junior and at this party she was completely naked being fed drugs at this party now i had thought these parties were like was like a party with 30 people you know when a couple of teenagers slipped through and they were in a corner drinking <laughs> this was like five people four people at this party with an 18 with a naked 17 year old child giving her alcohol giving her drugs how this guy is not under the jail by now Okay, just because his dad got 400 million bucks, man, is a mystery to me. So it's, it's, mysterious, not, it's not even as mysterious as the mysterious symptoms over there in Arizona. Uh, which brings me to Madeline Soto. Soto, that little girl here, a little 13-year-old girl here in Florida. I did a show about that. When the story first came up, she went missing. She didn't, she didn't make it to school. Uh, she was with her, her mother's boyfriend, was supposed to take her to school. Uh, some new surveillance, some new interrogation videos came out. You can find them on YouTube. The first one came out by this god awful, annoying woman who was interrupting the damn interrogation with her commentary. And most of her commentary was like, oh, Wow! <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a lie. We know that's a lie. It was this interrupting this, I, I had to keep trying to skip ahead. For, finally, I found a couple of them that are totally uninterrupted. But the mother of this little girl, okay, allowed this little girl to go upstairs because she says the day before she went missing, 
She forgot to take her medication. And when she was at work, she was all confused and she couldn't smile. She was distracted. So she told them the next day, I need to have a good night's sleep because they all three of them slept in the same king size bed. The 13 year old girl, this incredible loser of a boyfriend that is like a big giant baby, unemployed. His parents take care of him. He's buying video games all day and Pokemon cards and all this nonsense. At one point in the video, he's got his shirt off because they're taking pictures of him, you know, in the interrogation room there for evidence. This guy's not even a handsome guy. He's a flabby, pathetic, male boob guy, you know? She's letting her little kid, 13 years old, sleep with this guy upstairs in a bed alone. When the girl goes missing, the cops get his phone. They recover photographs, even though she knew that he reset the phone before he sent it to the cops. They show her a picture of this guy molesting her little girl. After she sees that, she says, you need to get a lawyer. My daughter's missing. I saw a picture of you raping my kid. You better get a lawyer. That's her response to that. So disgusting, so outrageous. This guy is, uh, what the hell do people see in this guy? This loser, man. Uh, Somehow, uh, my algorithm. Yeah, she sent. (laughs) uh, Oh, you've been following Metal and Sota too? Yeah, that program, right? Oh, what a horrible, horrible, horrible. And somehow I got on this YouTube algorithm of uh, these interrogations of parents who killed their little toddlers and four-year-olds and five-year-olds. That's what comes up now in my feed. Very, very um, stressful and distressing. One last thing, and I got to tell you, if you can look this up, because it's not in the news hardly anywhere. But a lot of people saw this thing. There was a, a real UFO over Tampa, Florida. It was a big triangle, translucent UFO in the sky. And there's another thing flying over toward it, too, and flying around it. Um, It's not CGI, 100% not CGI, because people saw this, okay? People saw this in real life. Um, And uh, then you can find the videos on YouTube. It's on videos online. If you look up Tampa UFO, it just happened this week. Check it out. It's pretty intense, man. Anyway, boys and girls, we're out of time. If you can help me out with Reels on TikToks, I got a lot of content, man. I'd love to put up there a lot of stuff about Diddy, a lot of stuff about uh, um, Taylor Swift. <laughs> you know, a lot of stuff like that. Not about Swift. We'll, we'll, we'll bury that. The Opera Mirror Report Integrity will, will, will bow to the Swifties. Okay, it's the one time you'll get me to uh, conceal. Like two days ago, the UFO was two days ago. All right, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, dudes and dudettes coming up after this will be patrick Berge. the guy's always gold man he's always got great content um if you can help out with a donation this week that would be great if you can help out retweeting uh sharing the shows we're getting into the holiday season where every share counts 10 times more than it does during the year this is our meat and butter bread and butter this year also too i was contacted by um uh, I heart Spreaker um, individually. And I said, Ed, if you got any big guests coming up that we can promote to our advertisers, we could tell them, hey, Ed's got a big guest that's going to have a lot of uh, traction, a lot of hits. We can get you live read ads on that show, okay? which is you know, good money. So if you can think of a really, really good guest, man, because right now I'm going to be putting some work into reaching out to, you know, like like Lev Parnas, man, I reached out to him. He's about to be on MSNBC, you know. That would be a huge guest, but I, I think uh, now he doesn't need me, you know, so I don't think he's, we're still chatting, but uh, he hasn't committed to coming on, although he's kind of gives me a smiley face and things like that. I don't know what to tell you. I got his number if I really want to bug him. Anyway, so if you can find me a real good guest this week, man, guys, really big guest. Think big, think big, and I'll, I'll put the pressure on them. You know, normally, I don't, I don't, if a guest is a diva, I don't, I don't I say, hey, screw you. I'm willing to put up with a diva guest at this point. All right, guys, I love you so much. I really do, man. Thank you so much. And, and Ileana, I know you're not listening at this point of the show. I hope. <laughs> Okay, after all the things I've been talking about. But happy birthday to the little girl there, man. And go to the GoFundMe, man, for this kid. Um, they're really good people. They're really, really good people. They've helped me out so much here in Florida. And the GoFundMe is called uh, Help a Little Girl Celebrate at Disney World. And her name is Ileana Nicole Preston. Hey, God bless you guys. Good night. Get a 
shiver in the dark, it's raining in the park in the meantime. South of the river, you're sobbing, you hold everything. The band's blowing Dixie, double four time. You feel alright when you hear the music playing. You step inside, but you don't see too many faces. Coming in out of the rain to hear the jazz roll down. A competition in other places. But the horn is blowing that sound. Way on down south. Way on down south London town Check out Guitar George He knows all the chords When it's strictly rhythm He doesn't want to make a cry or sing The said an old guitar is old When he gets up under the lights to play his thing And Harry doesn't mind if he doesn't make the scene He's got a daytime job, he's doing all right He can play the honk, talk like anything Saving it up Friday night with the sultans, with the sultans of swing. And a crowd of young boys, they're fooling around in the corner. Drunk and dressed in their best brown baggies and their platform soles. They don't give a damn about any trumpet playing band. It ain't what they call rock and roll. They are the Sultans. They are the Sultans who play Creole. Sultans, we are the sultans of swing. <laughs> 